So another enzyme that we're gonna take a deep dive on the structure and function relationship as we learn about how PKA works. Okay, so taking a step back, we need to look back at our adenylate cyclase system. Remember the first time we saw this system was when we did our cholera toxin case study. And we understood how cholera toxin sort of inhibited the inactivation of a, uh, a, a process in this pathway that ultimately led to hyperactivation of adenylate cyclase. So led to high levels of cyclic AMP. And that's where we're gonna pick up our story here. So one of the big things I want you to remember is cyclic AMP is a need state signal. Cyclic AMP is a need state signal. And we're gonna see how this comes into play because cyclic AMP is an important activator of an enzyme called PKA. And we sort of looked at this briefly when we had our cholera toxin case study and I highlighted that, hey, we're gonna see this again. But PKA becomes active in the presence of cyclic AMP. And one of the things that I want you to remember about PKA is that it is a master phosphorylator. So a master phosphorylator. So it is a kinase, which means it's going to be adding phosphates, taking them from ATP, and putting them on a serine, threonine, or tyrosine of a substrate polypeptide. And so it's going to be active in a need state. Okay, so these are some of these big logic check pictures that we want to make sure that we're sort of thinking about. Okay, so Cyclic AMP, again, I want you to remember that's a need state signal. So when we talk about what's going to be happening when we're under a need state, one of the things that can be a need state signal is high levels of cyclic AMP. Uh, other things that we've learned about are low levels of glucose, right? So we're going to look at this on the uh, next page here, but I want to show it to you here. Okay, so that we can sort of see what's going on and then we'll sort of map it on sort of structurally. So one of the things that we see is that when PKA is inactive, it is in what we call a tetrameric state. There are two catalytic subunits and we show those by the C. So we're not in Star Wars here. This R2C2 just represents the structure of this inactive tetramer. This tetramer has two catalytic subunits and then two regulatory subunits. And I want you to think about these regulatory subunits like babysitters, okay? When they are babysitting the catalytic subunits, the catalytic subunits can't do their activity. We're gonna look at the structure of the regulatory subunit in just a little bit to understand how and why. But when we have the regulatory subunits interacting with the catalytic subunits, PKA is in an inactive tetrameric state. So again, we'll look at structurally what happens here, but looking at it just from this simple equation, this is an equation I want you to know. When there is ample amount of cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP binds to the regulatory subunits. You can almost think of this as you're distracting the babysitter, okay? The babysitter is now interacting with cyclic AMP and it's no longer babysitting the catalytic subunits and those catalytic subunits can then go on and do their chemistry. Remember, PKA is a master phosphorylator. So what's going to be happening is these catalytic subunits are going to be using ATP, transferring the gamma or the terminal phosphate from ATP to a serine threonine or tyrosine. So serine threonine or tyrosine on our protein and taking it from an inactive state to a phosphorylated R state. Okay, And then there's lots of cellular responses that can sort of happen with this. So in a very um, sort of simple way here, I'm gonna run through what we know sort of as a, um, a downstream, a cellular response, if you will, here. So we're gonna talk now about the phosphorylation cascade that happens, one of the many phosphorylation cascades that's initiated by activation of PKA by elevated levels of cyclic AMP. All right, so we're gonna have PKA, okay? PKA is going to be adding phosphates to serine, threonine, or tyrosine residues of downstream polypeptides. One that we haven't yet learned about, but we'll take a deep dive on next semester, is called phosphorylase kinase. And phosphorylase kinase, as the name implies, is an enzyme that will put uh, phosphates 
on serine, threonine, and tyrosine residue. So it is going to phosphorylate its downstream target, which is a bit more specific. That is going to be the serine 14 of the enzyme phosphorylase. And we have seen that enzyme. I'm gonna flip back one slide. If you haven't seen this picture, if this picture is totally foreign to you and you're like, I don't know what this is, make sure to go watch the video on phosphorylase um, activity. And so phosphorylase is the enzyme that breaks down glycogen. So coming back down here, let's see if we can sort of put this all together with a phrase that when you first hear it, you think we're sort of in a, in a tongue twister sort of competition here. But here's the phrase, okay? PKA phosphorylates phosphorylase kinase, phosphorylase kinase phosphorylates phosphorylase, and phosphorylase phosphorylizes glycogen to break down glucose and remedy a low blood sugar situation and need state. That's a lot. If you need to, go back and just rewatch the past 10 seconds, right? But PKA phosphorylates phosphorylase kinase, phosphorylase kinase phosphorylates phosphorylase, at that serine 14, and phosphorylase is responsible for phosphorylizing, breaking apart using an inorganic phosphate glycogen to generate free glucose and remedy a low blood sugar level. So that's the cellular response. So one of the big picture things that we're gonna to wanna to make sure we know how to do is take sort of a big picture upstream signal, if you will, low blood sugar and understand all of the pieces that we work through to ultimately have the cellular response that addresses that signal. Low blood sugar, break down glycogen to release glucose to the bloodstream. Okay, so that's a big picture sort of of how that happens, okay? What we're gonna do now is we are going to look at the structures of both the catalytic and the regulatory subunits and understand sort of how they work and they do their biochemistry. Okay, this is the catalytic subunit here, okay? So a couple of things to highlight. Remember, this is a kinase enzyme. So I'm gonna highlight here this molecule. I didn't get that. This molecule that we have right here. Okay, I'm gonna zoom in a lot of times to this structure so that we can see this. Remember what kinases do. Kinases, are gonna take the phosphate, the terminal phosphate, that gamma phosphate from ATP, so that's what ATP is there. Just orienting ourselves from our structure standpoint again, uh, phosphorus is always yellow, oxygen is red. So here are, and you can't see sort of the first one, there are the three phosphates that we have on, there's the adenine base on ATP. Okay, so we have the terminal phosphate here that is going to be properly positioned to be transferred to a substrate polypeptide. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. That's gonna be down here, okay? So there's ATP, okay? Um, this enzyme has an important, it has an important phosphate group on itself. So PKA itself must be phosphorylated. So it has a threonine 197 that's gonna be phosphorylated itself. So let's zoom back in here and highlight where this is. One of the things you're gonna to need to do is label relevant pieces on uh, these protein structures when you see them and highlight what's going on and why they do their chemistry. Okay, so right here, that is that serine, I'm sorry, that threonine 197. So let's go ahead and label that. This is this threonine 197. So this is a threonine that's on the catalytic subunit of PKA that itself must be phosphorylated. We haven't talked about the upstream guy yet that makes PKA be active. That's another story, okay? But when that threonine 197 is phosphorylated, then PKA is active. And how this threonine 197 helps make it active is it helps to, with its negative charge, to bind and orient the substrate polypeptide here. So let's zoom back out here for a second and see what we have here. What we're gonna see in orange here is the substrate polypeptide. So I'm gonna highlight that in orange here. So the substrate that we have here is what's shown in orange. So here is the substrate polypeptide. So that's whatever PKA is phosphorylating. Remembering PKA phosphorylates many things, okay? So importantly, within sort of the uh, substrate active site that we have here, I'm gonna highlight this in red here and then we'll kind of go back on what we look, 
here is a substrate recognition domain. So just like things like serine proteases will recognize certain amino acid sequences and know that they're supposed to do their chemistry there, same is true with kinases. We're gonna have this white residue right here. So this is a white residue. That's gonna be the serine or the threonine that we're doing chemistry on. And then flanking it here in pink is a substrate recognition domain. So let's kind of go back here. This is not anything you need to know the details of in terms of the residues. I do want you to know here that this serine or threonine was that white portion here. And then don't need to know sort of what's happening here in terms of you don't need to know the substrate recognition sort of uh, sequence, but you're going to have two arginines and then a small um, amino acid residue, your serine or threonine that you're phosphorylating, and then a bulky aromatic residue. Okay, so that's what we're sort of going to have here in this recognition domain. So these regions sort of represented what we saw in pink on what we had there on our substrate binding domain. So kind of coming back here and zooming back in here. So again, we're going to have um, two arginines, right? A small um, amino acid residue. Here's your serine or threonine that you're gonna be adding a phosphate to, and then it's followed by a bulky aromatic residue. So that's sort of the recognition domain that we're going to have. If a protein has that sequence, it is a substrate for phosphorylation by PKA, okay? So those are all the structural pieces I want you to know for PKA here, let's zoom back out. And again, reminding ourselves of that all important equation. So what we're looking at right now is this catalytic subunit. And right now, as we're highlighting what's going on here, this catalytic subunit is what we have shown right here because it's free, okay? It's able to bind its substrate and it's able to do chemistry. And the reason that it's able to do that is it has disassociated from the regulatory subunit here by the presence of cyclic AMP. So on our next slide, we're gonna highlight and look at the structure of, of uh, the regulatory subunit and understand first, how it inhibits the catalytic subunit, okay? And then secondly, how it, uh, that inhibition is relieved when we have the presence of cyclic AMP, okay? So big picture here, and this should make sense, I want you to think about the regulatory subunit as a competitive inhibitor. And why am I saying that? Because it is going to bind to the catalytic subunit in the same region as this orange polypeptide. So if the regulatory subunit is binding here, then the catalytic subunit can't bind a peptide to do its phosphorylation chemistry, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at that regulatory subunit and kind of highlight what's going on. So again, this is the regulatory subunit. So what we're gonna be showing and looking at right now is the regulatory subunit as it's bound to cyclic AMP. But let's first highlight how the regulatory subunit will be doing its regulating. How is it a babysitter, okay? So remember, I want you to think about this guy as being like a competitive inhibitor. So competitive inhibitor. And the important piece of this that allows it to be a competitive inhibitor is this magenta piece that we see right here. So this magenta piece that's kind of highlighted back here, okay, that is going to be a region that binds to the catalytic subunit competing with where the substrate would bind, okay? So flipping back to our previous slide here, okay, it's going to bind to that, that magenta region is gonna to bind to that same region that we have kind of a peptide that wants to be phosphorylated by PKA. And so it's going to be inhibiting it from doing that, okay? So as long as that purple, that magenta region from the regulatory subunit of PKA is binding in the active site of the catalytic subunit, then catalytic subunit can't bind its orange substrate polypeptide and do its phosphorylating chemistry, okay? So now what happens here is we have cyclic AMP that binds, okay? There's two cyclic AMPs that are gonna bind to each regulatory subunit. And what we're really showing here are monomers, but even the regulatory subunit, those two babysitters kind of hang out together as a pair and then they are distracted by four um, cyclic AMPs. And here's where those cyclic AMPs bind. I'm gonna zoom in here, okay, highlighted in blue. 
there's one. There's the cyclic AMP. We can see the orange or the yellow phosphate that we have here. So there's that monophosphate, and then here's the cyclic um, uh, a the cyclic adenosine sort of group. So there's one of them that's there, and then here is the other one. Okay, so here's the other sort of cyclic AMP. So what we have right now is a regulatory subunit that's binding cyclic AMP, which means it's been distracted from its job of being a competitive inhibitor for the catalytic subunit. So now the catalytic subunit is free, and this is the key part here, the catalytic subunit is free to do its phosphorylating of downstream substrate polypeptides. Okay, And in the story that we've talked about, it's going to be phosphorylating phosphorylase kinase. And that's so that phosphorylase kinase can phosphorylate phosphorylase, which can go ahead and break down glycogen. Okay, so just as a summary slide to put this all together, and you can see the structures of both of these on the same slide, right? And unless you know what's going on, right? On, you know, uh, show these to somebody who's not a biochemist and they're like, well, those guys are kind of the same thing. I see pink and purple squiggles, right? You need to be able to look at these structures, distinguish who's who, and tell me why we have all of these important pieces that are either allowing them to do chemistry or inhibiting them from doing chemistry. And at the end of the day, we want to be able to connect sort of states in our system with downstream effects. So if we are in a fed state, right, uh, high blood sugar levels, that means adenylate cyclase is going to be inactive or less active. So we're going to have low levels of cyclic AMP. Low levels of cyclic AMP, those babysitters aren't distracted. The regulatory subunits are binding to the catalytic subunits. Catalytic subunit then cannot do its chemistry. We're not having kinase activity, and then we're not going to be breaking down glycogen. Glycogen breakdown is inhibited. Take the flip side, and these are the kinds of questions you're going to be seeing on exams where you have to tell me the sequence of things that happens in a cascade to connect you know, a, uh, a state, a signal, a system, okay? with a downstream effect. So when we are in a need state, uh, again, in our system, we might be talking about low blood sugar levels. Low blood sugar levels, we're gonna have glucagon, right? The secreted from the pancreas, that can be a signal that activates adenylate cyclase, increases concentration of cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is gonna to bind to and dissociate the regulatory subunit from the catalytic subunit. That catalytic subunit allows us to do its cascade. One last time, that cascade is phosphorylating, phosphorylase kinase. Phosphorylase kinase will phosphorylate serine 14 on phosphorylase. That will put it into the R state, which is going to allow it to phosphorylize glycogen, liberating free glucose, and remedying our, two minutes ago, started the conversation with a low blood sugar level. Wow, that's a lot, right? But that's where our course is moving to, is being able to put together all of these pieces to understand how our body fixes a system that's wrong with a downstream effect.